So today we're going to be discussing the lead up to the French Revolution and the events that occur in the summer of 1789. The French Revolution is by far one of the most important events uh, to occur in European history and arguably world history um, in the 18th century and certainly going forward, right? Sort of jumping ahead, the ideas of the French Revolution and the, and the events of the French Revolution will inspire revolutions that we'll, we will keep talking, coming back to over the next couple of weeks. Along with that, the documents created by the French Revolution, the things such as the De Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, the Civil Constitution of the Clergy, they will have larger impacts and be part of, of sort of the canon of world history, again, moving forward. Uh, and, and for those of you who take you know, a 20th century history course or, or moving forward, those ideas will become part of sort of what human rights are uh, in the 20th century. So when we look at the French Revolution, right, one of the things that I've tried to, to discuss over the last couple of weeks has been this changing dynamic going on throughout Europe, right? There has been this growing liberalism that has emerged in, um, in Europe during this period, right? So you have the ideas that um, people are endowed with, with inherent rights and, and those rights should be listened to and those rights should be validated. But you also have this sort of growing conservative movement where you have um, you have uh, the nobles and the church and people who benefit from the monarchy pushing back and sort of reasserting their control. And that'll be a large part of what we get into uh, later in this in this lecture. So throughout the 1700s, right, there is this emerging, uh, there is this emerging tension within the French government. And again, we'll, we'll look at this in just a second, but as a little way of foreshadowing, right, um, you have growing um, economic tensions being put on the French government, growing uh, intellectual or social uh, tensions that are emerging within the, the bourgeois class, the bourgeoisie, and uh, you know, a conservative movement that is not going to want to relinquish their privileges. And we'll be looking at those over the next couple of minutes. So on the brink of the revolution, France is really one of the most populous countries in Europe and, and quite frankly, um, uh, in Europe or really in the world, right? Paris, I should say France, has 50 cities that are larger than Boston on the brink of the American Revolution or on the brink of the Boston Tea Party, right? So France is an extremely, uh, you know, large company country, um, something, you know, to the tune of about 26 million people living in France, which is, which is huge, right? Um, you also have massive cities. Paris is 600,000 people, right? So when a revolution breaks out in Paris or when the revolution breaks out in Paris in 1789, France is extreme, is huge, right? Uh, and, you know, again, France has at this point many many institutions that are going to help spread these ideas of revolution very very quickly. When we look at when we look at the the, the country right and the privileges that are being given to certain groups of people right the nobility is about two percent of the population and the nobility is the second estate, the nobility has about 400,000 people in total, right? So when we look at, when you look at the nobility in the 1770s, right, uh, it, it is a very small chunk of the population in total, right? So that's including children, uh, small nobility. Um, and then you also have about 100,000 religious figures, right? So 100,000 priests, sisters, cardinals, bishops, and all that. 
but there is this growing other class, and that is the bourgeois class or the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are folks who are relatively wealthy, right? As particularly when compared to people like the, the peasants, right? But they are making their money more and more um, in in sort of professional classes, right? They are making their money as uh, as sort of tangential to the land ownership. Some of them may indeed be even themselves landowners or land barons, or they might be themselves, um, uh, you know, wealthy enough to be considered or have the lifestyle of the nobility. However, because they are not blue blood, royal blood, they don't have that right. They don't have that privilege. Now, there, the... Palmer, this R. Palmer discusses the sort of psychology of revolution, where there is this psychology that is emerging, focusing on a disconnect between the institutions of the government and then the ideas of the people, right? Where you have this growing sense of um, disunity among the two sort of major institutions, right? The people and the government itself. Now, France is going through some major domestic struggles as well. In the 1770s, there's a new French finance minister, a guy by the name of Jacques Necker. Uh, Jacques Necker. Now, Necker was a Swiss banker who comes into France in the 1770s to try and reform the economy of France. One of his major goals was to try and use less, so basically, instead of taking out new loans and new taxes, try and use the existing format to increase the, or generate more wealth. Now, the problem that, it, that, it, that happens here uh, is that people just don't trust, um, don't trust the French government at the time. But even more importantly, you know, France is just is is has a very lopsided economy. In order to run, in order to run uh, the, the the French government, they're using about half of the budget uh, just to sort of run the life of the king and the queen and the court. Necker also becomes very popular, even though he's unsuccessful. Uh, he becomes very popular with the people. Necker, uh, after about two years, is replaced by Cologne. And he comes in and he discovers that there's no real accounting methods going on. Uh, and he really struggles uh, as well. So he winds up uh, getting pushed out as well. And the expenses of the government jump exponentially in a 10-year period, right? They go from... Uh, 37 million to about 110 million livres, um, you know, was a nearly a three hundred percent increase. Along with this, right, there's other governmental <coughs> failures and other governmental uh, deficiencies. So you have something called the Diamond Necklace Affair that happens in 1785. So Marie Antoinette, who was Louis this Louis the Sixteenth's wife, uh, winds up. Uh, inheriting a diamond necklace uh, from Paris uh, jewelry makers. And when she refuses to pay for it, she doesn't want the necklace, um, the, 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 mer the artisans who built or made the, um, the necklace go into revolt and, and, and start bad-mouthing her. Now, here's the thing about the diamond necklace. It wasn't hers. She didn't commission it. Uh, it was commissioned by Louis, Louis XVI's father, Louis XV, for his mistress, uh, the Madame Barry. So this gets ping, pinned to Marie Antoinette, although it's not her fault. Uh, but again, this does more to uh, damage her reputation. Once again, we're still in a period where... We're still in a period where um, there's these antiquated systems, right? 
there's this rank ranking system within the within the army right that certain nobility has a pri more privileges than others so certain statuses are given to the certain noble classes right so there's something called the nobility of the sword uh, so the nobility of the sword is sort of the old school nobility the nobility that uh, once you know earned their position through fighting for the king compared to the nobility of the gown which would be more recent nobility who earned their position through being lawyers for the king or being merchants or buying buying a gown right buying the position but none, nonetheless right whatever position you are whether a nobility of the sword or the gown they paid little taxes, right? They paid, you know, certain, the Duke of Luxembourg, for instance, paid zero taxes, right? So nonetheless, right, you're, whether you are a noble of the gown or noble of the sword, you're, you're receiving very, you're paying very little taxes, excuse me. Now, along with this, right, there is this growing, um, growing concern over something called the May Edicts. So the May Edicts were a set of uh, documents, a set of, uh, ed well, edicts, uh, laws, promulgations, issued uh, that limited the parliaments, the provincial parliaments, from having any say. And so once again, right, you have you know, you have the king the, from Paris making these promulgations and the clergy and other, other nobilities are getting disgruntled about the, sort of contesting their rights. The average folk out in the provinces are getting upset because this is limiting their ability to produce, um, produce uh, contest to the king, right? So parliaments, one of the things parliaments could do was uh, give sort of remonstrances or give uh, sort of things that they had seen as wrong with the king to the king, right? They could l put up these lists of, uh, of disagreements. And, you know, this is what's being limited here. So... The government is, is going bankrupt. The government of France is going bankrupt. There are all these external, uh, external outside of the government, I should say, disagreements, whether, whether it's the clergy or the nobility or the, the bourgeois or the, the average folk. So in, on May 4th, 1789, the, there's a convening of the Estates General. Now, the Estates General is a sort of super parliament where all three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the average folk all come and meet at the at a meeting hall in Versailles. Now, the meeting, right, is so the, the convening of the meeting is really just a slight to the third estate. As the third estate is marching in, right, they are dressed in black in this sort of drab uh, clothing. Then in comes the nobility in their nice robes, and then in comes the the clergy in their nice robes. Finally, the king comes in on his sort of, uh, you know, and the royal family in their fineries and process in. And then Jacques Necker gets up and gives this this very long, very rambly, very technical speech, talking about the need of all the people to fund the government. And this is really just sort of showing that there's going to be this sort of royal resistance to any change. For the next six weeks until the middle of June, there's nothing happening. So the third estate pulls out, declares itself the National Assembly. And on June 20th, you have um, the, the tennis court oath, which basically says the, you know, the clergy, I'm sorry, the third estate, the National Assembly, will, not, will continue to meet until there is a constitution. So continuing throughout this period, there are continued struggles. July 14th, there is the storming of the Bastille. On August 4th, there's a gigantic meeting of the National Assembly, and they demand certain things from the, uh, from the royals, from the, the, the crown. The National Assembly says that they want 
abolishing of feudalism, getting rid of special rights for the nobility, reform the tax structure, all of these different rights. And they push it through, and the king really doesn't have much say, right? But they're also sort of paper victories. On August 26, 1789, there is the most famous document, again, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And this de declaration is extremely important because it focuses on where the power of the government comes from. And it focuses, it puts the power of uh, the power in the people, right, in the nation. There's also a debate there over whether the king should have an absolute veto or a limited veto. And again, there are these sort of, there's a the debate here over liberalism versus conservatism. This is what we often consider the good revolution, right, where uh, we are pushing for the rights of the individual. We are focusing on limiting the king's power. The bad revolution comes uh, in the 1790s. Finally, the last big thing that happens in sort of 1789 is in October of 1789. We call it sometimes the Women's March, um, but it's not just women involved, although most of them are. So these poor women living in the docks and, and uh, sort of the the really tough professions storm the, the the Palace of Versailles. Food prices are going exponentially high. And there are rumors that the king and the queen are hoarding grain. So the women storm the uh, the women storm Versailles and they force the king and the queen to come back to Paris. This is the last time that Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and the royal family, for the most part, are in Versailles. And at this point, the king has to listen to and has to work with the National Assembly because now they have been kicked, the royal family has been kicked out of their home. So this is an important moment. Uh, for that reason, but there's also another important piece, and that is this is action done by the poor, right? This is action done by the average folks of France. This is not actions done by the nobility or the clergy or these major institutions. These are average, everyday folk with agency acting, and that's the important piece here. So the summer of 1789, 1789 into the fall is a major event, right? Because it moves quickly. Uh, you know, the States General meets on May 4th and by October, uh, so what's that? May to October is five months, right? You have a lot going on. The king is now out of Versailles, forced to talk with and negotiate with the third estate. And, and, all, and, and you have the August 4th meeting where all these demands are sort of paper victories. So again, all of these events are occurring extremely quickly.